And our mission is really to activate the power of this community to create a more regenerative and equitable future. And we get to do that by working with an incredible cohort of Summit Fellows, people who are working on all sorts of challenges in the world and who do really remarkable work. And Nasreen, our speaker today, is one of our, our Fellows, now Fellows alumnus. Um, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about her story. Nasreen was born undocumented in a rural village. She was forced to work in a sweatshop where she experienced the very dark realities of modern slavery, a topic that I have learned so much more about from her and the, the really beautiful way she holds both the darkness of what's happening in the world and the opportunity we have to change it. Nasreen leads social businesses and nonprofits dedicated to ending modern slavery. She is a voice for the 50 million people who are voiceless in this challenge right now around the world. And in the session, she's going to tell a bit about her culture and also shine a light on the consumer culture and the human cost of our purchases. And I want to invite you all to just take a minute to notice, like, we're at this big event. There's lots of consumption that happened to bring a lot of us here. There's lots that happens in this community context. And perhaps the opportunity we have here is to listen to Nasreen's story, to rethink some of our own personal relationships to consumption and to share that with others who are on board to invite more people into this conversation. So with that, we're going to play a brief intro video and then Nasreen will join us on stage. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Nasreen Sheikh. I am a survivor of modern day slavery and the founder of Empowerment Collective. In today's world, inexpensive products and corporate profit shape the habits of our consumption, often at the expense of human lives and our planet's well being. Nasreen Sheikh was born in the rural village of Rajura, India, on the border with Nepal. Her exceptional resilience provided the strength to overcome childhood trauma. And today, she is an entrepreneurial advocate for disadvantaged women, an international public speaker, and a leading voice for human rights. In my village, births are not documented. I do not know my birthday or my exact age. I grew up believing that girls and women are commodities, not human beings. When I was about 9 or 10 years old, I went to work in Kathmandu. I lived and worked in a 10 by 10 sweatshop with 6 other people for more than 2 years. When the sweatshop closed, I found myself living on the streets. But it was there that I met a kind man, Leslie John. He was a scholar who spoke many different languages. I became his one and only student. When I was about 14, Leslie helped me acquire my first loan for sewing machine. Soon afterwards, I met Rita. She spoke my village language and was living on the streets. When Rita asked for help, I taught her how to sew. This was the beginning of my work. According to the United Nations, as of 2022, 49.4 million people live in modern-day slavery, and over 70% of them are women. The Empowerment Collective's contribution to the global effort to end modern-day slavery takes a grassroots approach, building relationships and creating long-term generational healing. Empowerment Collective is dedicated to raising global awareness and providing marginalized women in Nepal and India the support and skills they need to ensure their self-sufficiency and dignity. At our empowerment centers in Kathmandu and Tarai, women receive training in vocational skills and health education. They graduate with the confidence to become artisans, mentors and entrepreneurs in a transparent and fair trade industry. We invite you to join the growing movement of conscious consumption. 
Let's choose products created with full supply chain transparency that are made with care for our beautiful planet. Each choice we make has the power to bring light to the millions of people still living in darkness. I am Nasreen Sheikh, survivor and leader in the movement to end modern day slavery. Hello. It's so good to see you all. And in 2018, I became a first fellow, a summit fellow. And out of thousands of incredible, talented fellows from 203 different countries was applying to be a fellow. And I was so lucky to be included. Um, when I walked into Summit, I was not aware of anything. And um, after a year later, I met a kind person, uh, Kevin Vulcan, who became my mentor and gave me some tools and knowledge and really helped me step into my power. Um, I also met with Brian Meehan, who became our funder and helped build our second women's empowerment center in Nepal. And last year, I met Jeff Rosenkel, who said that you should come and speak at the summit. So here I am today with all of you. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. Um, I have a question for all of you that how many of you know what modern day slavery is? Oh, wow, like four or five of you are aware of that. Thank you so much for uh, doing that research and becoming aware of that. Uh, recently, GSI report, Global Slavery Index, um, says that 10 more million people got into slavery, which is, makes uh, 50 million people. Out of those 50 million people, 28 million of them are in forced labor, and 22 million of them are in experiencing forced marriage. Um, unfortunately, I had to experience that. I, um, I come from, as everybody talked in the video, I come from a very, very rural village with no electricity, no cars, no hospitals, uh, a place where children are born on the floor of their family homes and neither birth or deaths are documented. So when I was born, I saw that my village was beautiful. It has like so much access to nature, yet the community was very led by male domination. And I experienced that some of my aunt was really going through hardship. I witnessed a murdered, I witnessed um, a horrific situation in life. Um, I saw that every single girl around the age of like 18, 19, 20 being forced into marriage. And when, uh, um, when my own 12-year-old sister was being forced into marriage, I asked my mother, like, she's unhappy, she's crying, she wants to go to school, why are you forcing her to marriage? And she said, it's not me. And I was like, then who? And she said, like, it's the society, it's the culture. Um, and, that, and she said that this is what happened to me, this is what happened to your sister, and it will come to you. This is something generational, this is what this village represents. Um, so since that time, I was like, oh my God, it's me. I'm going to be forced into marriage. And slowly I became so disconnected with my own families and around my communities. And I could not find any inspirations or any knowledge or any resources with the world. So what I did, I started to pray and I would spend most of my time in nature. And <laughs> I would see the sun and I would run with it. I would see the um, trees and just hug it and pray. And I realized that uh, uh, nature could talk to me and I could talk to nature. And that slowly gave me a courage to decide to leave my village. When I was around nine or 10 year old, I decided to leave my village with the help of my cousin only for looking for freedom. I really wanted to be free out of that generational trauma, generational karma. So um, I was thinking that I will leave and I will have a better life and I will be free in the city. But all of a sudden, I was in the capital city of Kathmandu with like um, in, in, in 10 by 10 room with six other people. 
uh, a 10 by 10 room with like door closed, windows shut downs, and the agent is coming and going and saying like, okay, you have to work and finish these 500 pieces of clothes in a week. And it does not matter how many hours you work, but you have to finish this quota on time. And if you don't finish this quota on time, you will not get paid at all. So for that reason, we had to wake up around 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and work all the way to like 8, 9, 10, 11 p.m. And and still, these pieces would not finish. And, and that's when the agent would come and splash cold water on our eyes and would tell us, like, you have to finish. I, I'm being pushed by other people. And if we don't finish it, we will not get paid at all. So um, that's when I prayed again. And I could not talk to anybody. So I started to talk to the clothes that I was making. And I said to those clothes that whoever is going to wear these clothes, I hope they can feel me. I hope they can see my tears and my bloods. And in the sweatshop, there was no bed. So I slept on the large bundle of clothes. And I would daydream about where they would end up and who would wear them. Um, like that, I worked for almost two years. And the agent made us work for two months and left us with two, two months' salary and disappeared. And six of us became completely destitute and disempowered. And we didn't know what to do. Um, other people, they went to find a job in another sweatshop, and I became a street kid. And I think I was around 10 or 11 um, when I was in, on the street. Um, when I was on the street, one thing that really inspired me is to see all these students going to the school. And I always wonder, oh, I wish I could have a book, I wish I could have a backpack, or I wish I could have a shoes, that I wish I could go to school. But my reality was so different. My family was taken away from me. My community was not there. I was not educated. I was very, very vulnerable. And in Nepal, that's how 10,000 plus women every year gets into human trafficking, just being on the street. And I could have been ended up into the next loop of, 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 of slavery. So um, I just really feel like it's very important for all of us to really connect and understand the power of one. And today, I want to pray with you that, you know, instead of these 22 million girls and the boys are being forced into marriage, I hope they will get education. Uh, these 28 million people who are stitching these logos uh, of the companies, I hope they will become engineered to actually solve the climate change or human rights issues. Those are my prayers that I'm praying with all of you and dreaming with you. Um, and, and sharing this story is not an easy for me. Um, it took a lot, of, a lot of courage to come here on this stage uh, to share that. Um, so I'm on the street. I'm feeling destitute, disempowered. I have no one, uh, no one to look up to. And one day, a miracle happens. Um, I'm sitting on the street, and I see a dog come to me and sniff my hand, and I get startled because dogs are so wild in, in poor countries. And um, behind this dog is this gentle, kind man. His name is Leslie John. He's a white person, and he speaks perfect Nepali. And he says to me that, don't be scared with this dog. He's like my son. Come here and fed him. And... For the first time, somebody in my life was telling me, come here and fed him. Um, so I immediately grabbed his wrist and I asked him, uncle, please, can you teach me? This person, Leslie John, became my mentor, my father, my teacher, uh, my inspiration. He gave me education around arts and poetry and philosophy. And I was really uh, started to understand that what is human rights? What is happening in my village? Why my village is undocumented? Why I don't know my birthday? Um, and then I came to understand that I, my whole village is the part of modern day slavery. Um, and there is not just me and my village, there is actually 50 million people. So that really inspired me to uh, take a small loan and I bought my first machine and the the little skill that I have learned in the sweatshop, I started to make my own products. And with that products, I was 
I was successful. I was making with love and care. And we had more demand, so I started to work with more women and disadvantaged and marginalized women. So in 2012, I, um, I started my first business called Local Women's Handicraft. And uh, my look, that's the picture that you could see, it's fading away. It's, hmm, I did this um, uh, slide because I feel like my life is like a game. It's a game, like I have to put together these stories and, um, and my shop almost became an activism place where the journalists and the artists and all around like the community started to come together. And it was more than a business. And in 2012, a woman from Canada comes and says like, um, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, we're just sewing these things and making sustainable fashion. And uh, she said, like, can I write this story? And she write our story in Forbes magazine. And I did not know what Forbes magazine was in 2012. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was like, yeah, OK. So you know, um, coming from the country that I come from, we face a lot of challenges. We face humanitarian challenges. We face climate change uh, uh, challenges. And in 2015, Nepal was hit by 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Um, I was in Nepal and I was on the phone and the earth shake like this for a teeny bit and then like, psh, just like literally like we fall off and my phone goes thrown out. And within like few seconds, like 9,000 people died and billions of dollars economy loss and so many beautiful heritage temples and uh, got destroyed. Um, so that's when my business also really struggled and I became, um, I became more like a humanitarian. So also in 2016, one of my friends said like, you should come to America and speak. And I was like, me speaking? I don't know, I'm still dealing and healing with my trauma and I'm trying to help with some people. And she said like, no, you should come. People in America don't know uh, what's really happening on the ground and you should come and speak. And so I said, okay. So in 2016, I came to America and I walk to this major department store and I see piles and piles and piles of clothes and I really did not know what, who made these and I started to have a memory coming back like, oh my God, these are the clothes that I used to make when I was a kid, when I was a child. And, uh, and I came to realize that, you know, right now, today, almost 80 billions of uh, pieces of clothes are being sold today, uh, which is, people are consuming 400 times more than 20 years ago. It's, it's very shocking, and fashion is also one of the most, one of the second polluting industry in our planet. And uh, so that really inspired me to actually open a nonprofit to fight with uh, modern day slavery. Um, and, uh, and as I came to America, the more I learned, I started to meet with, meet with very, in, uh, with very influential people. And uh, I started to understand that what is indigenous knowledge? What is these looms? You know, what are these crafts? So in our center, we built, uh, we brought a 100-year-old loom that does not need any electricity. We work with the farmers who harvest hemp, and we, we use this very traditional loom and spin and make these beautiful yoga mats. And, and we are really coming, all these survivors are coming together to, uh, to stop, uh, stop fast fashion and uh, really connect people with what are you wearing. Recently in my research, I saw that uh, if you're wearing synthetic fabric, you are putting 5,000 negative uh, energy in your body. And if you would uh, wear some linen or hemp, it's 5,000 positive energy you're putting in your body. So um, after meeting Gloria Steinem and Pope Francis and so many incredible um, uh, corporate leaders, I felt like we were all trying our best, but we were so disconnected with the source of manufacturing. 
people simply did not know how to map their entire supply chain. So I was just like traveling around and seeing and it's like, oh my God, people are consuming so fast and, and they don't know what they're consuming, their clothes or their shoes, they have no idea. I don't know how many of you know about fashion revolution. They are uh, campaigning around who made my clothes and uh, you should really look into that organization, uh, Fashion Revolution, and uh, you could also join a campaign around who made my clothes and really ask questions, because what will happen is, um, as I said, like America is importing so much slavery, it's almost uh, 169.6 billion dollar uh, of the products just alone America is import importing that contain slavery. So when you go to a shop in these places, you know, the supply chain transparency is completely hidden. And hidden means it's children like us, it's people like us um, who don't know their birthday, who don't have documents, who, uh, who can't speak for themselves. And these are the people that is also heavily impacted by the climate. So if you could really start asking questions and start uh, buying from the local artists and local businesses, um, it will not only help um, all these people who are the victim of those uh, situations, but also it will help the climate. Um, as I said that, um, you know, I, the more I was learning, I found that, you know, America has a very interesting uh, history with slavery. Um, and I was thinking that maybe this is the free country on the planet. Uh, then I realized that actually slavery exists within this country also. And, uh, um, and there is around 1.1 million people around in the garment industry, in the agric agriculture industry, that is working for many, many hours and not being paid. Um, I also came to understand that um, how America is um, like, it's, whew, it's, such a, it's such a different country and I feel like it's so, I see so many people being aware and talking about investing in climate and forgetting about, uh, uh, forgetting about human rights and forgetting about indigenous communities. So it's very important to include us. And, and then I met with Fair Trade Certified and Whole Foods and there's a whole new movement going on around uh, consume sustainability. So sustainable, uh, one of the way that I feel like you could really um, consume good products is by supporting local artists within your own communities or asking questions. Uh, you should also think about like one of the t-shirt uh, is made, it, it contains almost 300 gallons of water that one person could drink for a year. Um, so seeing the impact through our consumption um, the, the food industry, the clothing industry, the, the, the shoes, the glasses. Um, and so all of these um, are very, very important. So for this last 10 years, um, I have been documenting my story and uh, I have been really thinking about how to document the story around the aspect of survivor. Um, and from the lens of survivor, because a lot of the films and the uh, uh, research are done through um, very intellectual people, which I honor them, but hasn't anything hasn't done through the survivor experience. We don't have so much knowledge around information, um, but what we have is, a, is an experience and our experience around our cultures and our traditions and our language. And if we can really listen, you know, we are not the best communicator. Like I speak five different language and it's really hard for me to, to speak into English. So um, I, I'm trying my best to, to really translate this uh, impact. Um, and I hope that you all can really, um, really start asking questions. And this is a new topic. If you can do a research, there is a really great organization called International Labor Organization and Walk Free, uh, which is uh, re um, releasing the report around GSI. 
So, um, and we are having the first release in UK. Um, so if you could keep an eye on it, that would be really, really great. Um, if you would, uh, I'm just curious, how many of you know the clothes that you're wearing today, where it come from? Do you know any of, any of you here? Ah, two people. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate that and honor you for knowing where your clothes come from, where your food comes from and making an impact because we live in an interconnected world where everybody is connected. And if 20 years ago, somebody would have asked questions, where my clothes come from, maybe I did not have to be in the sweatshop. And, uh, um, and, uh, and just uh, thinking about going back to my community, it's terrifying because uh, we are experiencing generational trauma and my family, I have not been to my village for the last 15 years and uh, um, everything is stolen from us and we need help here. Uh, we need support, we need people who have access to electricity and access to internet. It's such a privilege, we forget how privileged this country has. This country represents the true freedom, not only for the American, but the inspiration for the rest of the world. So how can you use your technology? How can you use your language and resources to really make a connection with those 50 million people? Um, I will be, I think uh, my time is getting over now, so I will be here and I would like to connect with you more um, if you will have any questions. Uh, as I said, I'm a learner, I'm still researching, I'm still healing with the psychological things that went in my life, seeing my childhood is completely being black and filled with trauma, it's like so hard to see, but it's people like you that gives me hope, that comes here and listen to voices of survivor. Um, and I want to inspire you that if you have companies and if you have organizations, please invite survivors. They will have a different experience. They will have a different story to share. They will have different knowledge to share. And maybe that is one of the way to really help the humanity and the climate because it's such an interconnected community. So thank you for having me and I'll talk to you later. <laughs>